take a moment, a pause that refreshes, and remind ourselves previously on a Jewish journey to the Gospel of John. So, to bring us back into the moment and pick up the narrative, um, if we go back into the narrative, removing the adulterous woman and going and picking up from the words that immediately preceded the inserted uh, uh, passage, we go back to 743, and again, this is right after Tabernacles, or during Tabernacles, and a division occurred in the crowd, a pilgrimage crowd. The crowd was filled to overflowing. Uh, a division occurred in the crowd. Because of him, some wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. It's a very, very important point. Um, although they wanted to, they didn't. For whatever reason, they were restrained. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees. They said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Those are Levites, the temple police, the temple cops. Uh, and, well, they're not going to carry out the instruction to bring them because this guy speaks uniquely and they constrained themselves from seizing him. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not been led astray also, have you? No one of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him, has he? In other words, he would uh, not be worthy of consideration until one of us uh, 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 puts our imprimatur of uh, authority on him and we give him the A-OK. And as long as my gang, our gang, doesn't approve of him, you shouldn't approve of him either. And so since no one in the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? And then, of course, uh, enter Nicodemus in a moment, who is a Pharisee. But the crowd, which this, this crowd, which does not know the Torah, is accursed. It's an extraordinary way to speak of your own people. The rabble, the, uh, the, the, the common people, those who have not been to the Ivy League yeshivas we have attended, and teach at, they are, well, they're mere flyover people and their opinions really are so uneducated they are not worth listening to um, because they are not the religious or the cultural elite. They, in fact, they're accursed. Sounds familiar. Um, well, Nicodemus, Pharisee, uh, who came to Yeshua before being one of them, Pharisee, said to them, hold on a moment, hold on one Cotton picking moment, that's in the original Aramaic. Our law, Torah, does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? Let's try to rein things in a little bit, calm down a little bit here. Let's listen to what this guy has to say and the response that he got from the leadership was, you're not also from Galilee, are you? Are you identifying with them, you, the teacher of Israel, you want to identify with them because, let's be honest here, even if you're just trying to broker for honest dialogue, the fact that you're not against him like we are indicates that you're with him, that you are identifying with the people who like him. And if that's the case, your standing might be soon canceled it's the original cancel culture. Search. See that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And from that point, we now pick up the narrative right after the, parope the uh, pericope with the adulterous woman section, and we go into uh, the second of the I am sections. The, there's always a, uh, an, an I am. There's lots of I ams, but this is I am with a predicate. And we have seen thus far... We've seen only one statement, I am with predicate, I am the bread of life. We're about to see, I am the light of the world. And just as we talk about the section where he says, I am the bread of life, say, this is his speech. We call it fancy schmancy word, discourse, bread of life discourse. So too, we call this the light of the world, not speech. We say discourse. It sounds like we have more education that way. Well, this occurs in the location that we just saw, which is the court of the women, this section right in front of the temple 
building, this court. Uh, and you saw in the film, was actually very, very helpful. They, uh, first of all, they showed you that the temple was still, even in Jesus' day, was still under construction. They hadn't finished it yet. Uh, and uh, so there were still pieces that were under. But this also was where the, uh, the uh, uh, collection boxes were. And the collection boxes were all had the shape of those, of those shofars. Uh, and you saw them throughout, if you were paying attention. You saw them in the film. If not, just imagine that they're there. But this is the location in the temple where this is about to happen. He doesn't tell us this right away. Tells us this a few verses later. But I'm just setting the stage ahead of you. I want to remind you that the festivals in John's gospel are determinative. They are around, the gospel is arranged around the Jewish festivals, and the Jewish festivals provide the foundational information and context in which Jesus' words, his teachings, his actions are understood. Tabernacles began in chapter 7, and the uh, repercussions, the, the, the context of tabernacles will continue through the next two uh, chapters, eight, seven, eight, and nine, and half of ten. We're only in eight right now, and again, tabernacles is informative. We spoke of one of the festivals, or one of the festival's um, uh, um, activities, which was the ceremony of water drawing at tabernacles. We must speak now of another uh, festivity uh, activity, uh, and that is the lighting of great menorahs. Let's take a look. In the Mishnah, it is a whole section, a whole section called Sukkah, uh, uh, named after the holiday, and uh, at the conclusion of the first festival day, remember it's an eight-day celebration, the conclusion of the first festival day of Sukkot, they descended to the women's court, and there they would make a great enactment. The rabbis, in other words, the leadership, would make a great enactment, golden candlesticks, by which are meant giant menorahs on giant poles and four golden bowls on the top of each of them and four ladders to each. These were uh, illumination monstrosities right there in the court of the women and four youths drawn from the young priests in their hands were jars of oil, which they poured into the bowls from the worn-out pants and belts of the priests so that it's holy material. They're making wicks. And with them, they kindled the lamps. And there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated by the light of this festivity. So that is the context. We've seen the water drawing. We've seen now that along with the water drawing in the evening, the entire city is illuminated by the light that is shining from the temple. And just as Yeshua took advantage of the symbolism inherent in the ceremony of water drawing at Tabernacles, so too he's going to take advantage of the symbolism inherent in this uh, great uh, menorah, this great lighting uh, candelabra illumination. In verse 12, he begins the light of the world discourse. And he begins it by saying this way. Thus, Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. That is Another, just as you want water, living water, come to me. You want the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, you must come to me. That's what we saw in chapter 7. We see another rhetorical bomb, another, let's say, rhetorical matzo ball being lobbed by Yeshua out into the crowd. And he is not only the source of the Ruach HaKodesh, the source of the living water, not only the bread of life that we saw two chapters previously, now he claims, look at the light. You're impressed with the light? I, I can trump that. I am the light of not Jerusalem and not Israel. I'm light of creation. I'm the light of the world. And he who follows me because I am 
illumination. If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness by definition because I am the light of the world. So you couldn't possibly walk in darkness as long as you follow my light. But in fact, not only will you have light, but you will have the light of life. It's an extraordinary statement. Who, you have to read the subtext of this passage and the question that the reader should be asking and the question that, that you should expect the audience present in the temple there to be asking is, who does this guy think he is? Who is he claiming to be? That really is the great question mark, and you can see the, the struggle in his audience as they, because this is not something that any Jewish fella, even a highly educated rabbi, even a leader of it, would ever claim to be the light of the world. And I'll tell you why, because light in the Hebrew Bible is so frequently associated with the Lord himself. And I think that's obviously Jesus is making, Yeshua is making a very uh, strong allusion to the precedent set in the Hebrew Bible that God is associated with light. And if God is associated with light, the light of creation, the light of the world, uh, the light of Israel, and I am saying that I am the light of the world, that there is a definite statement being made, draw your conclusion, God is light, I am light. Hmm. So Psalm 36, 8 and 9 actually is a wonderful verse because it marries the concept of the living water, the Ruach HaKodesh, with the light of Messiah. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you, with the Lord, is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. In other words, when we look in the dictionary, Hebrew dictionary, of course, and we look uh, for the word light, we see the Lord reflected in that definition. In your light, you have true light. We truly see light. And it is a fountain of life for us. Isaiah 9, we looked at last week as well. We'll look at it again because it's that important. There will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, a light will shine on them. What is the light? Is it God? Is it something else as well? Ah, we look to the end of the passage and John 6, or uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and, and 7, which we won't read 7. But a child will be born to us. You're familiar with this passage. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Peleoetz, Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, Mighty God, Aviad, Father of Eternity, and Prince of Peace, which is translated in Hebrew, what? Yeah, if you don't know this one, get out. Yes, yeah. Sar Shalom, yes, exactly. The House of the Prince of Peace, that's the name of our congregation. Um, and Isaiah 49, speaking, it's one of the great Messianic prophecies, speaking of the servant of the Lord, he says, it's too small a thing. This is God speaking to the servant. It's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, Israel, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations. So a light to Israel and a light to the nations, i.e. light of the world. I'll make you light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And of course, John 1, the prologue, which we spent so much time at the beginning of the series, spells out this theme right from the get-go, from verses 4 and 5 on. We should be expecting this concept to be revisited, as it is here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In your light, we see light, right? The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. And while the People who walked in darkness will see a great light. Not all of them will comprehend. The default state of creation of the world is 
darkness, one must make a choice to come to the light, even no matter how brilliantly it shines. And in fact, he goes on and speaks, when he speaks with uh, Nicodemus, this was John's comment after the, uh, after the conversation Yeshua had with Nicodemus. This is the judgment that the light, Yeshua, has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. These are themes that we see pop up sporadically throughout the Gospel of John and Yeshua is, uh, is uh, sowing into that foundation that's been laid. And in fact, it continues, everyone who does evil hates the light. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness <laughs> doesn't enjoy it, doesn't want to come to it, and does not come to the light. How come? For fear that his deeds will be exposed. When the light shines in the darkness, the cockroaches are exposed and they go scuttling away trying to find the darkness again where their deeds cannot be seen. So don't be a cockroach. Come into the light. He who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And what we see in this next passage and in next week's passage as well, which will continue this discussion in chapter 8, is really almost a, I, I view it as a well-choreographed dance that goes on between Yeshua and, uh, and the, uh, the leadership of the Jewish people. And if you look at it in this way, as a choreographed conversation... You play your part, I'll play my part, you'll make your, uh, almost like a debate, like a choreographed debate, like a choreographed dance. Um, we'll understand what's going on with Yeshua. You bow, I will accept, and we'll proceed forward. You'll see what I mean as we go forward in this conversational and confrontational dance between Yeshua and the Pharisees. But the Pharisees said to him, you're quoting yourself right now. We're going to quote you. You are testifying about yourself. As you said previously, if you read your own gospel here, you're you told us this last time you are in Jerusalem. If you're testifying about yourself, your testimony is not true. John 5, 31. If I alone testify about myself, Yeshua said, this is after he healed the man at the pool, Bethesda. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Well, they're laying on Yeshua's own words back at him. So if you want to like the idea of a dance, think of a tennis match, lobbing back and forth. Because Deuteronomy 19.15, of course, famously says, single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So you cannot testify on your own for yourself. There must be other witnesses in addition to you. And in fact, in the Mishnah, Ketubot 2.9, however, no one is believed as to himself. This is rabbinic law. And they said to him, no one may testify concerning himself. That's what they're saying to Yeshua right now. You are testifying about yourself, not convincing, not compelling. But Jesus answered. And Yeshua answered and said to them, even if, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, my testimony is valid, and I'll tell you why. For I know where I came from. If you knew where I came from, you'd think it was valid too. But you don't know yet. For I know where I came from. And not only do I know where I came from, I know where I am going. And, of course, readers in John, if you've read the prologue, the first 18 verses, we also know where he comes from and where he is going uh, to be with 
his father. But you do not know where I come from. You do not know where I am going. But I'll continue. You judge according to the flesh. Everything with you is surface, is appearance, is external. I'm not judging anyone, but even if I do judge, even if I testify about myself, even if I do judge, my testimony is true, my judgment is true. And here's why. Because I am not alone in what I speak. I am not alone in it. But I am the Father who sent me. When I speak, when I testify, when I judge, I am never alone. I am always the mouthpiece. I am always the representative. I am always the officially endorsed ambassador of the Most High. And when my lips move, it's because that's his opinion. And I express his point of view. How about you, though? Even in your law, and it's interesting to see here, lots of people make a big deal, of, hey, Jesus said your law as if he's separating himself from the Torah. Don't you know that Jesus was a Jewish man, a perfect rabbi, perfect, the perfect rabbi, the perfect man, the perfect Jew who lived in subjection to the law? Yes, Yeshua followed with complete and utter fidelity every law which applied to a Jewish man living in the, uh, in the land of Israel in the first century. Absolutely. However, Yeshua is not subject to the law, and it is here that he is flexing his identity muscles and demonstrating, I am above the law. I am not on the same plane as you exalted leaders of Israel. We are not equals. And so, at this point, one of the few times he does this, he puts a little bit of distance between himself and the Torah. In other words, we all have to get into our heads that Yeshua is far more powerful, far more potent, and far more important than the Torah given through Moses. Remember, we follow not Moses, we follow our Messiah. The movement we are immersed in is a messianic movement, not a Moshianic movement. And so he says, your law. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true, which we've just read in Deuteronomy. And he says, here's how I get two. Here's my mathematics. I am he who testifies about myself. And the Father who sent me testifies about me. So we have two in one. The Father who sent me test. When I speak, I represent his opinion as well. So the Father, his opinion testifies to me. Which gives the Pharaoh, the year of the Pharaoh, which gives the Pharisees, the leadership, the opportunity to say, well, since you brought up your father, let's press on that. By the way, Yeshua, where is your father? Because we all know your background story. You are illegitimate, and you don't, this is going to come out next week. I'm going to press that again, big time. So they want, they're trying to lead him down this way. Where's your father? And Yeshua answered, not going to take the bait. You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Notice I have highlighted the pronouns, which are odd in the general discussion, when Yeshua is speaking, he's been speaking of the Father 
in general. God, the Father. But since we're talking about my Father, let me be very explicit. I can say, unlike any of you, I can call God, the creator of heavens and the earth, the Lord of all, I can call him my Father in a way that's very personal and in a way that you have no part. How you like them apples? How you like them matzo balls? And in fact, if you knew me, you would know my father also. If you recognized me, you would recognize my father because we're aligned perfectly. But because you don't know me, we can draw ipso fatso the conclusion, you don't know the father. And of course, the corollary would be true if you knew the father, you would recognize me immediately. So there must be something deficient about your faith practices and your understanding. These words he spoke in the treasury. Now we're setting the stage, which I did in the beginning for you. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Watch that phrase because we're going to see it. We've already seen it. No one sees them. How come? Because the hour, his hour, the hour of his glorification, which uh, entails both the crucifixion, his suffering, and his resurrection, uh, the hour has not yet come for him to be glorified. John 7, 30. We just saw this back during Tabernacles, during Sukkot. So they were seeking to seize him. No man laid a hand on him. How come? because his hour had not yet come. Same idea, just a few verses later, uh, the same concept, people get so aggravated, they get so antagonized by him, and they want to seize him, but Yeshua is in control of his destiny, and he is not going to enter into his hour prematurely, only when the Father says it's time. So again, here's the stage, the court, of women. Now, what we see here in this dance, in this lobbing of tennis balls back and forth, is Yeshua making a series of contrasts. I am this, but you are that. I am from above, you are from below. I know the Father, you don't know the Father. So one way and the other way is a series of stark contrasts, and we shall see it. And it's all based upon the conversation that's already begun. It's going to be extrapolated. Then he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Singular. Where I am going, you cannot come. I go away. We know where he's going away. He's going to be with the Father. How's he going to get there? Through the cross, through death, burial, and resurrection. He will go to be with, and you will seek me. You will seek the Messiah, the Jewish leadership will seek the Messiah, but you will not find me because you're looking in the wrong places and with the wrong expectations. Therefore, you will die in your sin. Not sins, plural, that's coming later. This one big sin, the ultimate unforgivable sin, the sin of unbelief. The one sin for which there is no solution Aside from Jesus, you reject Jesus, there's no solution for you. You look for other messiahs, you won't find Messiah. You'll look for me in the wrong places and with wrong expectation. So you'll die in your sin. And where I am going, you cannot come. Later on, he'll tell the disciples of the upper room, he says, where I'm going, you'll come, not now but you will come. But these leaders, this leadership, you will not come because you will not seek me in the way that the Messiah is explained to be sought out. Instead, you will seek. You've seen this illustration before. Judaism's most popular false messiahs. My people have followed a succession of false messiahs who made a big splash for 
period of time, some lengthier than others. Shimon Bar Kochba in the second century, Moses of Crete in the fifth century, the Yemenite Messiah in the twelfth century, Shabbatai Tzvi in the seventeenth century, and in our time, the Lubavitch, the Chabad, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. You'll search for others and claim them as Messiah, but you will be disappointed. And ultimately, the bottom line is, unless you come to me, you will die in your sin, the sin of unbelief. You will not be able to follow me unless you search for me specifically. He said the same kind of thing in John 7, 33, you'll remember. For a little while longer, I'm with you. And then I go with him who sent me. You will seek me. You will seek me. You will not find me where I am. You cannot come. And they said, well, is he uh, going to go among the dispersion? Uh, and we can't follow him among the Jewish communities outside the land of Israel? Is that what he's intending here? Always misunderstanding Yeshua, one of the great, remember, the great... Uh, 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 tropes of uh, John's gospel is Yeshua speaks in spiritual sense and people are continually understanding it to be uh, in a concrete sense. Uh, can I really uh, climb back in my mother's womb and be born a second time? Um, give me this living water that I may not have to schlep my, uh, my vessel and come to the well every day. Give us, O oh Lord, this uh, bread, this bread of life, so that we might always be filled and never be hung. Always going for the concrete understanding when Yeshua is speaking on another plane. And what the Jews were saying, and this is how they're going to understand what he said, I'm going to go away, and where you're going, where I'm going, you cannot come. This is what they think now. So the Jewish leadership was saying, surely he'll not kill himself, will he? So before, they, oh, maybe he'll go traipsing around the diaspora, the Roman Empire. Now, he's going, we cannot come. Well, we'll seek him, we won't be it. He'll kill himself, which of course is a terrible sin uh, among the Jewish people in the first century, second temple Judaism. This was a profoundly heinous sin to take your own life, uh, but we wouldn't put it past this guy. He's so messed up. Uh, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, is the arrows, you, you are from below, I am from above. Contrast, right? Not you are from below, you're from hell. No. <laughs> um, you are you're of the creation. You're of the world. You are a creature in this world, this sin, sinful world, this world that's default position is to be live in darkness and not to have the light. Uh, you're from below, I'm from above. Presence of the Father. You are of the world. I am not of this world. How do you like Yeshua? He's out of this world. Absolutely. Straight from his mouth. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, plural now, because the fountainhead of all rebellion is a lack of belief, a lack of faith in God's provision. So sin, singular, unbelief, you'll die in your sin, and that sin of unbelief will birth, will be the foundation of the rest of your sins, which you will die in. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. <sighs> this is strong language. Are you catching the strong language? This is, this is not the kind of wishy-washy, namby-pamby nonsense that our culture is sprouting, spouting many ways to God and we, many truths and we all must follow our own path to God. No, 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 no. Yeshua is saying there's only one way. And this is for the Jewish leadership. So we dare not ever, we dare not ever apply the soft bigotry of low expectations or the soft bigotry of low theology 
and proclaim that the Jewish people have no need of the Messiah because they're okay on their own. They have their own relationship with God. It's only for Gentiles who are a little bit slow on the uptake. They needed something a little bit more concrete than the one God. We dare not ever say that because Yeshua stood there in the temple, in the court of women, right outside the area where the Sanhedrin meet, one of those, one of those uh, closed off areas. It's the courtroom. And he tells them, unless you believe that I am he. In Hebrew, Ani who? I am he. You will die in your sins. There is no other way but me. Even for the most exalted of Israel's leaders. Even for the most learned of the Jewish people, the most revered and respected rabbis of the day. There is no alternative for you. You must come to me. Elsewise, you will die in your sins. Can I say it again? Sure. Unless you believe that I am he. Anihu. You will die in your sins. In Deuteronomy, we have this phrase, God speaks this phrase, Anihu. See, now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. The same that Yeshua has been claiming for several chapters now. I have wounded. It is I who heal. The same that Yeshua has demonstrated so far. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Very similar to the language that Yeshua has used of himself. You mean to tell me that Yeshua is using language that God reserved for himself in the Torah? The answer is yes. Who has performed? Isaiah is a font of this kind of language. Who has performed and accomplished it? Calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, Jehovah, Adonai, Hashem. I am the first and with the last. Anihu. I am he. You are my witnesses, Isaiah 43.10, declares Jehovah, Adonai, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand what? That I am he. Before me there was no God formed and there will be none after me. And Yeshua, yet even though it's very clear that God is saying this is language reserved only for me, Yeshua has no problem in using that language and applying it to himself. Even from eternity, Isaiah 43, 13. I am he and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act. And who can reverse it? I act. If you do not come to me, you will die in your sins. Listen to me, O Jacob, Isaiah 48, 12. Even Israel, whom I call, I am he. Unless you believe I am he, you will die in your sins. I am the first. I am also the last. Of course, John's gospel leads with this truth. We should all understand this from the very beginning of the gospel. Line one, word one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Yeshua was with God. He was God. They are united in a mysterious and supernatural way, but nonetheless, Yeshua is the living representation of our God. So they were saying to him, huh? <laughs> who, who, who are you? <laughs> and I, I don't think they were saying as in, we're not following your logic here in the sense of how dare you? Who, who are you? And Yeshua said to them, I am what I've said I am from the very beginning. And for the readers, from the very beginning, from why and what. I've been talking the same, that's why there's so much repetition. I've been saying the same things from the beginning of our conversation together. But you know, as John 1.11 tells us right there in the prologue, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. The Jewish people, by and large, did not receive him. 
Some of them reacted excitedly for a while, but most were not impressed. They turned their back on him. Only a few, only a remnant, truly believed. But Yeshua continues, lobbing back and forth, bowing and taking the next step in the dance. You know, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Again, they're looking for a, his human father. And he's speaking to them about his heavenly father, missing the point entirely. So Yeshua said, here's how you're going to know. When you lift up the Son of Man, and you will know that I am he, Anihu, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Watch what he says here. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. I do nothing on my own initiative, and I speak these things as the Father taught me. We've seen those words before. John 5, last big conversation he had after the healing at Bethesda. I can do nothing on my initiative, same as he said here. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's been singing this tune from the beginning. They're just not catching the, the meter. They're just not catching the rhythm of what he's singing. So let's unpack this briefly. When you lift up the Son of Man, we'll need to look at, up, lift up, and Son of Man, you'll know that I am he. So when he's lifted up, when the Son of Man is lifted up by you, it'll be a eureka moment. And you'll know I am he. Because as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3, 14 through 15, last words he said to Nicodemus in the conversation. So that whoever leaves will in him have eternal life. And of course, Daniel 7, son of man, by this time, you should be sick of this phrase, son of man. You should be so tired. You should have memorized Daniel 7, 13 through 14, because it's key to understanding Yeshua's self-conception of himself. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came with the ancient of days, was presented before him. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is the son of man, not a regular Joe, but the apocalyptic figure who receives a kingdom from God, the ancient of days, and all will bow before him. All will come under his authority. So get in line, align yourself with God's plan and program. Verse 29, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Again, you're talking to me, you're talking to the Father. Okay, I represent the Father perfectly. He spoke these things, and as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Well, that sounds pretty good. Many came to believe that Yeshua was the light of the world. And that shouldn't surprise us because people still today come to faith in Yeshua, they still hear the words of Yeshua and say, okay, sold. It's been a while, it was a hard sell, but I do believe. And that is a perfect reason to look forward to a future that Isaiah spills out and shares in, toward the end of his book, in Isaiah 60, verses 19 and 20. This is the picture that Isaiah paints regarding the light. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. The sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane. For you will have the Lord as an everlasting light. And the days of your mourning will be over. 
Now, John takes this theme and he carries it over and he attaches it to the vision he has of the new Jerusalem coming. And what we see in Isaiah is exactly what John sees at the end of the book of Revelation, in Revelation 21, 22 and following. The new Jerusalem, the city, has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lamb. Why? Because Yeshua is the light of the world. The nations, that's the Gentiles. Any Gentiles here today? Right? So not only Jews, but Gentiles. The nations, the world, will walk by its light. So I invite you, if you have not yet taken advantage of walking in the light, if you have not yet come to the light, the light that is life, the light of Yeshua, today is the day.